from US in Canada. Good morning to you. Uh, well, if, it must be late in Australia, and I'm very happy to see people from NSW and a couple of other universities from Australia as well as uh, from Bangkok. Well, the profile of people who have been listening has been uh, healthily changing, uh, you know, to have a decent complement of architects and engineers. I have today with me a remarkable person called K. Sri Ram. But before I say anything about him, I must first tell you that this is about the future of construction itself. India has, as uh, many people dramatically put it, about 250% of what it has built over all time to be built in the next 12 to 15 years. I would reckon that the benchmark is 2030, but there are times when you know people think that this could possibly be 2032 to 2035. You have to also remember that the Paris Accord that India has signed means that we have to push back our carbon emission to 30% of, of, of 2005 levels, an impossible task if you ask me, but, and, and the government as well as industry has actually not woken up to the, the, the kind of immense demands that this will put on us next uh, 12, 13 years. So what is the future of construction in terms of business potential? What is industry going to do? What are technologies going to do to respond to this challenge in a way that you're going to be carbon efficient, labor efficient as India grows its GDP and provides greater quality of life for people. I have known this man, this gentle giant for about 15 years. He comes from a town that has grown into a decent size called Mysore, a 500 year old city. He has been amazing for the kind of galvanizing of young and old people that he has brought to public purpose in that city. He has always remained a backroom boy. He has never wanted to seek or secure credit for work that he has got his entire team of industry leaders as well as business leaders in Mysore and uh, other regions around it to be doing what they are doing. He, he says to me this morning that he has completed uh, uh, a weekend of a congress or an exhibition which had uh, which had which is which is the first of its kind in india he will talk to you more about this he is today the national head of corporate affairs of the builders association of india and uh, he is also uh, he is uh, well yeah could be that one yeah that's okay he is he is also uh, the joint secretary of credit national at the Builders Association for nearly 25 years, he has been uh, pushing initiatives, pushing things that could alter the way this 50 year old association, or is it 55 years old? It's a, it's a, it's a 70 year old. 70 year old association. You said it's therefore before independence, uh, has been driving things for the industry itself. Primarily, therefore, he's representing on one end contractors, big and small, and on the other, Kridai. He has been representing the interests of the building industry itself. At the IGBC, I'm happy to say that he's also been an executive co-committee member. He, he was responsible for founding the chapter uh, in Mysore and uh, has been driving things in ways that is also inspiring the other 22 or 23 chapters in India to do things that can be innovative and inventive. Uh, I think I will move on to see how I get to the countdown of 20 questions that we have and before that a little bit about the foundation itself you are still continuing to see response to this foundation in the next two or three weeks those of you faithful who have been with us all through the series of such webinars that you had see the name changing to Alltech foundation which is the parent institution 15 years old an institution that's done work across the world uh, very selective work, but it's, it's been so hugely discerning that it's not heard of. Um, you will see also a few other changes, exciting changes, to see how we can bring you quality education of this kind, sometimes at no cost, sometimes at a bit of cost. Uh, more about that as we go along in the next few weeks. And uh, one request as you, as for the newcomers, whatever you have as questions, you will see on the margin on your screen a chat box. I'd like you to see that you enter. We are monitoring it back in here in Bangalore. I'd like you to see that you are putting this in. And at the end of this session from Sriram, you will then answer those questions, as many of them as you can. 
and well, if, if, if you think that you haven't got answers that truly satisfy you, we can always uh, take this offline and Ankita, whose mail ID will appear on the last slide, will uh, we'll see what she can do to enable you. Uh, well, to the countdown questions, 20 of them. I'll start. Sriram, welcome to this uh, session. I'm, I'm really happy that you decided to give us time. I'm grateful to you. You are one of those people that I thought of maybe six, seven weeks ago, and I told myself, we are talking about the future of India. We have to talk to genuinely uh, uh, senior experts who come from insights that are very hard ground up. And so it's a privilege to have you here with us. Well, this first one is about how we have a, a massive 100,000 crores that are going to be spent on just the highways. We talk about the building industry. Sometimes we talk about a few other things that are related to it as, as an ancillary uh, uh, activity. But what are we doing at these significantly areas like highways and then into railways and a few other things that I'll ask you after? <laughs> well, sir, thank you for having me. And uh, it's always a pleasure interacting with you, uh, one of the visionaries of our industry. Uh, well, I think the uh, answers to all these things are that uh, if we just look back, I mean, if you look, especially when you spoke about highways. I think the game changer when it came to highways, we just look back, happened when the, uh, when the, you know, the Vajpayee government came up with the Golden Quadrilateral Scheme. I think the efficiency of our highway builders went up 10 times straight away, the minute the uh, Golden Quadrilateral Scheme came through. Why did it happen? If we can look at it, it, it happened because the government allowed the free import of technology and the free import of, of machinery, which we had never seen in our country till then. Right. And that really was a big game changer. And you saw the efficiency of the entire industry go up multifold. Okay. So now what's happened is, to take these things ahead, is that we have been, we have just come out of a huge period of policy paralysis, which, which, which had happened, and which had sent the entire industry into a dizzy. So what's happening now, okay, for the last three years, we have been talking about a lot of highways to be built, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the health of the industry was very poor. At a simple level, to every square meter, um, or shall we say an acre of a highway, 4,300 square meters, you know the quantum of uh, aggregates that we use and sand that we have to use. What can you do to replace these things in a way that we are more natural resource efficient? See, the issues here is, I think, if you can just look at, uh, I'll just bring you on to just a small, small parallel, because I think it's very, very relevant to this. See, now, you, all, you, you are well aware, because you're doing a lot of work on energy, the huge um, uh, increase we are having in coal-based power, which is what we're coming up in the next decade. There's a huge increase which is coming in there. We're, we're, we're adding a lot of uh, thermal power stations, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, no. the, let me uh, sort of button here to say that thermal plants from 2020, India has said we will not have any more new thermal plants. I understand where <laughs> you're coming from. We still have about 67% of our power coming from there. There is a huge revolution or a transformation of the energy scenario that is happening. Yes. We shall, you know, keep away from that if possible for now. But I do no, what recognize I, what, I, what you're saying. What I'm saying plants. is, yes. There's a huge output just coming out of these thermal plants, yes. which is which is which is uh, which is which is waste. Yes. Otherwise, you consider. Yes. So now this, the technologies are such that a lot of this is being used into into the into highways. A right. good part of these whatever we get fly ash, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is all being used back into the highways. Mm -hmm. And the other one is there's a lots of waste which is now being used into highways. And if you look at the, especially plastic waste, etc., which is all being recycled and which is coming into the use of highways. Right. But the bottom line is there's a huge amount of natural resources which is required to build a highway. And that we have not got out of. I mean, we have not got out of. What's happened is we have become much more efficient in the way we've been doing our grading, grading, et cetera, et cetera, which is bringing down the use of natural resources in a very large way. I'll just give you an example. Earlier, if you required X number of cubic meters to just form a highway, because we used to be just going on manual grading. So now today, the whole thing is computerized, it's robotized. And what is happening there is we are having a much more, much more efficiencies in our grading systems. 
So we are knocking off about 50, 60, 70 percent of the material required to grade the highway, which is a huge amount of uh, material just to happen earlier. Because now with efficiency, now with now just I'm just telling you, the use of drones in surveys and in and in uh, whatever we've been doing is making the entire thing much easier, much efficient. So what what it's doing is actually saving your environment because it's saving because you are using that much less of of material which is going into this. But I feel the major, major issue which is facing us in this, in the whole thing, in making these highways happen, is of course, many issues which are on the sidelines, which are on the policy issues. Because of the, there's a big disconnect between what's happening at the state level and the, and at the national, at the union government level. These are the ones that are stitched. Technology wise, I don't think we have an issue at all. We have, we, we have it in us to do that 40 kilometers, what we're promising per day. We have promised 40 kilometers a day. I think now we're delivering, I think, about 15 kilometers a day. But I think the only disconnect which is happening there is there because where we have to get, we have to stitch these things together. Right. It's these things need to be put put together. Now, there's, there's so many things where the state level issues are there which need to be ironed out. What do you see as upgrade of skills that contractors have to bring in the process? See, upgrades, there's a huge upgrade required, massive upgrade required. Do you see that happening among contractors? Not yet, not yet, because people are not woken up to the problem as yet. But I think the problems are going to be massive. It's it is massive and it's going to get bigger. If I'm a young engineer, you know, entering the, the construction sector today, working with a construction company, what would you advise me to do? I would advise you to embrace technology first, because the thing is, there's so many things to be done today. As I just already spoke about robotics, I spoke about drones, I spoke about all these things. Because recently, we in our in the seminar we had in Mysore, where we had uh, a seminar on 3D construction, robotics, and automation, we found out that almost one lakh engineers are required for drone drone related issues itself in our country. It's it's la it's large and massive, and there's nobody there. I mean, people are not there at all. I mean, I mean people are not aware of it. So the I'm just telling you one small part of it. You look at robotics, you look at the other things which are there, you know, all these things have got to bring in huge efficiencies because you can scale up. Can you give us an example of how robotics will actually help infrastructure companies or construction companies? See, today, I just go, go I just start off from a thing called pipelines. Huge amount of pipelines are going to be laid in our country. Today, we, want, we are looking at a huge LPG, I mean, uh, CNG backbone we're looking at. We're looking at everything which is going to be piped. Now, any of these inspection issues, etc., etc., in piping, everything is all robotic throughout the world. I mean, where you've got robots which do all these things, and now if you look at uh, drone robots which are there, the entire entire surveys which are being done in the which are which which is which, and the point of and paths of least resistance we call it. How you can take take a pipeline through a path of this, how you can take a roadway through a path of this, etc. You're getting a totally different three-dimensional picture, which is all coming out of these drones and these robots. Robots. I'm just giving you a small part of it. Okay, I see that. Uh, you know, if I talk about the Indian railways, for example, or the next slide, and uh, it talks about airports, we, India has to spend about forty billion dollars at let's say six thousand crores. Yeah. We, you know the amounts that we're talking about on just airports and these uh, on these uh, fifty new airports that the uh, government is contemplating now. Uh, or the railways and the adding of about 25,000 kilometers of new lines, which means another $3 billion, at least says the reports. No, much more, 14 lakh crores, we are talking of a, a, a number way, way larger. What do you think, therefore, India needs to be doing? You see, what we are also hearing is in just the next 24 months, or is it 18 months to March 2019, we are going to be spending as much as two and a half trillion dollars on just the railway stacking up obviously these are contractors who are doing yeah when I mean, it comes to railways uh, i think we have got a big problem because if you look at uh, the railway network 1947 we take a cut off i think 80 percent of the railway network today was built by the british absolutely so we have done only about 20 percent after after 1947 absolutely and if you're looking at these numbers what we're talking about here I think we have got a big problem I don't, because we don't have the bandwidth. Right. We definitely don't have the bandwidth. Exactly why when uh, the Prime Minister also speaks to the construction industry today, he says, you either buck up 
or I'm going to get the, get the people from around the world to come and do it. Because the population in the country is today very, very restless. The young population are restless and they all want things yesterday. Nobody has got the patience to wait and infrastructure is required very badly. So here I really foresee that the bandwidth which we have in our country, railways wise, is, is severely restricted. And if we can, we really need to upgrade very big time. Highways have got no issues. You ask us to build whatever highways, we've got the bandwidth and bring it up. Not an issue at all. Mm -hmm. Railways, if we, we definitely don't have the bandwidth within the construction industry to, to, to even think of even more 10% of the scale, 10 to 15% of the scale, what they're talking about. Could you extend that to airports? And, and I'm not talking only about the civil engineering parts of it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking more about the way, for instance, there is energy efficiency or whatever that is brought about in the way, in the taxiing time that aircraft take in the way that runways are designed and such. See, airports, I, th I think we've got the bandwidth. If yeah. whatever, whatever need to be put in, in the airports we have, the, I'm talking from the construction industry point of view. Yeah. Airports, we definitely have the bandwidth. What I have seen, for instance, in several airports, and I won't take the names of these towns or cities, where taxiing time extends up to 40 minutes sometimes, even if the aircraft is ready to take off. This is not something we want to repeat in the next 50 airports that what happens. I would suggest is what I would say is those mistakes are not from the construction industry the taxi Fair time right. issue etc etc because I'm, I'm talking from the construction standpoint right now so from the construction standpoint you give a you may, the designs are because I think basically what what's happening in the airports okay. is you are actually replicating what's been done around the world okay I mean you're not trying to reinvent the wheel basically yeah. Yeah. if you look at any of our new airports which have come up now you look at Bangalore Hyderabad Delhi you look at any yeah. of these new airports that have come up we just replicated replicated what's what's happened around the world or even better than that so if you look at that i think it's just that we need to get the get the act together on the design and right. the, on that part of it but i think from the industry standpoint okay. we've got no issues okay so into an industry that you're more comfortable with and have been working with for a long time 25 years and more is that yes, yes. About 34 years now. 34 years good lord what are innovations in building materials that will be responsible for shaping the future of the construction industry itself at a broad level and mm -hmm. then we will go down into the See, i think uh, there is going to be a dramatic shift in the yeah. use of uh, mm -hmm. material what we've been using yeah. all along yeah. because basically people want something different mm -hmm. all right this one one aspect which is coming through yeah. and i feel the issues are that we have especially because you since you have said real estate construction right till now mm -hmm. this real estate is basically built and uh, built, built, built built for sale i'm talking of built for sale right. when it comes to housing basically right but I foresee that the new, new generation of Indians, which, are, which is coming through, the, we call them the Uber Ola generation, may not be wanting to buy real estate anymore. So we, we, we will be, there will be a big shift. We will be building real estate for rental. Mm. So this is going to be very, why I am saying this is going to be very different is, a real estate developer is going to be seeing how well, how cheap it's going to be meant to, how effective it's going to be to maintain his property. So this is where I feel that, you know, they're going to be looking at energy efficiencies, water efficiencies, responsible use of waste, etc., etc. on the building, much in a totally different dimension, because he's going to be owning the property and he's going to be owning it for, for, for generations to come. And when he's going to be doing that, he's going to be looking at how, how well he can be maintaining the property, etc., etc. So when it comes to this, we are going to be seeing that they've got each and every property is going to be a multi-use, what I'm trying to say. Now, how do you... Uh, look, how do you make a 600 square feet apartment feel like a 1,200 square feet apartment? And what is going to be happening here is that you're going to be using much lighter material. This is something which you have been propagating for a very long, a long time, but I feel that the future is that we're going to see a lot of light material coming in. This is going to be very, this is going to be a big game changer, I feel, because right now if you look at the way we've been designing our buildings, this I feel is a very important point. 80% of a building, whatever the way you design it, is actually dead load. 80% is dead load. 20% is live load. I think we have got to change that. It's got to flip. When you're talking about 20% dead load and 80% live load, so then your live loads are going to be small. Just imagine how, 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 how lean your building This is going to be a big game changer, I feel, in the future. Lots of new materials are going to be coming in, and I think there's going to be of, uh, uh, various various materials which are going to be lighter and lighter. Do you want to uh, have um, take a stab at what the weight of a building would be? For example, 
even 15, 20 years ago, we, you know, you and I have also mapped this, how a 2,000 square feet building would cost about two, would cost about 280 tons of, uh, of weight materials. Yeah. What do you see the industry moving toward as a target? I'm not, I would, I would, I mean, I'm not I like to get into the tonnage part of it. Okay. But what I, what I would say is, it's going to be knocking off a huge number of percentage points there. It's, it's going to be knocking off a huge number of percentage points there. Mm -hmm. Because basically, uh, labor in our country is going at a premium. The skills are going at a premium. The fall will be the blocks. Yes, yeah, steel and concrete. concrete. Everything, everything. It, it's across the point. See now, if, if you just look at one small technology where we talk of uh, 3D panels, we yes. talk of 3D mm -hmm. panels, I'm knocking off almost 80% of the weight with, with the 3D panel system. Mm -hmm. I'm knocking 80% of the weight there. And the minute I'm knocking off the weight, these buildings are going to be thermally more efficient too. These buildings are going to be thermally more efficient too. So, you know, the future is lighter construction, definitely. Lighter construction and an innovative use of material. I will move to uh, what I'll skip the okay. What I we will move this being a revolution. You've already spoken about this. Let's move to, for example, solar so, ties. Do you see? Do would you want to offer any comment on here? See, <clears throat> see the issue with solar tiles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I think uh, it has started quite some time ago. But now today people are talking more about this. But if you ask me personally, I always feel that our traditional materials, which have been which have been using over the years, mm -hmm. have been more effective. Mm -hmm. Have been more effective. The way you design a building, I think it is just not a solar tile as a, as a standoff issue, which I would like to have. Okay. I think it's intrinsic into the, into the whole design. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the uh, issues of solar passive architecture. Which, was, which have been very much part of the uh, whole uh, whole issue. So this is something which I think is more relevant to the whole thing than if you come up with a one-off issue like a solar tile. Fair enough. So I think I'll skip that one or the next one on insulated concrete forms and such things. I, I wrote these as observations for you to see if you would want to say something. Yes. Have, a, okay. have, a, have definitely have, have a big uh, future in our country. Okay. But there is only one issue which is, which is here, which is, I think, quite a major issue. Mm -hmm. The mindset of our people, the final user in our country, yes. is still archaic. What if I said that these could be used in, say, commercial buildings because you don't have a decision maker on that building that is where he's going to... But the, on the aspect is, is, on the aspect is in commercial structures, mm -hmm. in commercial structures, what's happened is these, this technology has still not come of age. Because there, is, there, there are issues with, with, your, with your spans, there are issues with all those things in this particular technology. Okay. So it needs, it needs, this technology also needs to be evolving okay. to bring it to that level. Okay, I'll move to, go on, to, to, to 12. You can move to 12. Um, and those of you readers who want to check what those observations were, you will find it on uh, uh, response city slash response seminars a couple of days from here when it is uh, put up, the recorded version is put up. So here, is there anything that you want to say? I don't want to be reading this. Yeah. That is, in terms of, no, see, that is, uh, laminated timbers. Definitely, definitely. definitely. Yes. The, the, I feel that uh, this is quite exciting. Okay. This is, uh, okay. it's got a big future. Okay. But unfortunately, we don't have the uh, bandwidth in our country. Okay. And we've got very little of these manufactured in our Actually, country. Actually, the context is more, I suppose, American. Or, I mean, yeah, yeah. So if, but so, if it, as and when it does come into, of our country, yeah, definitely excited. Okay, um, and sustainable. Fair enough. Anything on bricks and carbon sequestration or pollution absorbing bricks? These are these are things that yeah, these are things. Seen. It's still nascent. Okay, the entire technology is very nascent. Okay, but I feel carbon, I mean, uh, sequestration and absorption by using the right sort of greenery, etc., mm -hmm. etc., et around your buildings. I think they are something which is low hanging fruit. Okay. Which I think should be incorporated into all uh, all uh, all design, but this I think that can really really fair. really help. I think really that's a fair point. Yeah. Don't focus so much on materials for sickness. Yeah, because we, we still don't have it here. Absolutely. What I'm trying to say, yes, it is. It is definitely there. Yeah. If it can be coming in at a cost point, which is yeah. not very very prohibitive, yes, definitely it can definitely help. Okay. On concrete and green mixes, you have had these very interesting two things to say to me over the years. Is there anything that you want to? Uh, share with these uh, young professionals on what that contour is for the future. 
See, I think I've always said this that, you know, uh, cement and concrete basically is a gigantic scavenger. It's a gigantic scavenger because uh, it is used and you mean you just you just throw out any, anything at it, it might be, be flash or, uh, or blast furnace slag, whatever. Concrete have absorbed it so hugely that they're not, not available today. <laughs> Waste products are not available today. It's not to that level. Where today uh, you, you don't get uh, flash, it's not available outside because all of these have been absorbed by concretes. Today we are looking at high performance concretes which are absorbing 50 60 percent of uh, as puzzle loans. I mean, we call all these puzzle loans, they're all going in as puzzle loans into concrete, and they're high performance concrete. We're talking of M80, MM120. I mean, we're talking of very high performance concretes, we're talk talking of freely flowable concretes which can you know which can just flow just anywhere without any any it doesn't require any mechanical inter intervention mm -hmm. so we're looking at all these things and we're looking at what we're using a lot of waste into that mm -hmm. which is what what is what that means is that now for every kg of cement i'm using i'm using almost more than half a kg or sometimes even 600 grams of waste mm -hmm. which is which is going 60 percent of waste which is going through this which with along with this mm -hmm. so this is a big big uh, winner if you can look at it because you know you're actually manufacturing that much less cement mm -hmm. you, you need yeah. to manufacture that much less cement because the waste is waste have been going into it and at the same time it's been included into increasing the performance of the concrete mm -hmm. because today we're not talking of high strength concrete we're talking of high performance concrete mm -hmm. great so I, I think in a certain sense you've also gotten to the, the next part on waste materials and tools yeah. but beyond concrete do you see other areas where the building industry could you know, creatively use waste and upcycle. See, now if, if you look at this, I think uh, there's been a lot of constant, lot of focus going into C and D waste. Mm -hmm. Yes. Construction demolition waste. It's okay. become a major, major, major bugbear for many cities in our country. Yes. But today we at Pidai are actually focusing a lot on C and D waste and how it can be responsibly used. We for us as a company, last 15 years, I have not thrown out even one tractor load of waste from my site. I've been using entire CND waste, processing it on my site, and using it totally with on non-structural concrete, backfills, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, totally on our sites. So now we're doing a lot. We're actually trying to take this out to the entire country, trying to say that how can you responsibly use CND waste? So this, I think, we are now bringing out a paper. We're bringing out a, a best practices book on CND waste itself, because I feel if everybody starts using CND waste again. Right. You're drawing that much less from the ecosystem, you know, from the yeah. which is already sparse. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the big challenges India has is that it has to release heat, unlike the West, which has to, you know, sort of trap heat. Hydroceramics is one of those things that they are you beginning to use. You see value there in such materials and allied, you know. Surely, heat. surely. So yes. there's, a, there's a huge, huge value there. Yeah. Because as you said very rightly, you need to be releasing heat. Absolutely. And I think we also need to go back into a bit of our history. And look at what the way the buildings were built then because when i say this there's many people who appreciate it but there are many people who are also a bit uh, skeptical about it and many because, others who want to know how to do it yeah how to do it yeah because yeah, how to redevise this also there are many people who are skeptical because they feel that in the in the scale in which we want to be doing things next you can't be looking at that but i i i, I beg to disagree because i feel you need to break it down into many issues there what what they have done and uh, if you break it down into many issues, for example, the way they treated their roofs, I'm just giving you a small example, the way all our ancient buildings have treated their roofs, the way they have treated their ventilations, yes. the way they've talked about fenestrations, etc., etc., in those days, I'm talking about. Because if you look at any of our uh, old buildings, they've got huge uh, verandas around it. But the immediate question from a young professional will be is this scalable and replicable? It is scalable. It is scalable. Now, I mean, you you also you also seen what they've done at Mazda, at at uh, Abu Dhabi. What have, what have they done? Please tell me what have you I mean, you've seen it? You've gone through it. What have they done? They've actually just gone back into history, drawn drawn back from history and done done whatever. And it's it's huge scale. That's the scale which they've done. Okay, people might say whatever, but I feel it is possible. Sure, it is definitely possible. Fair and into bio concrete. Anything that you want to share? No, I would not like to be talking okay. too much about this because I don't know much about it. Fair enough, we'll skip that part. But, but then, uh, those of you listening, I want you to think about, this is an area that 
every professional ought to know or should know. But these are directions into the future. I'd like to see if it inspires some young person out there amongst you all to do either some research in this area or to see how you can get someday to be implementing them for a future that, uh, you know, is uh, something that we are not able to envision just now, perhaps. Into, um, well, on choosing cladding systems and such. I put this up because, you know, I have often seen you talking about these things with a certain, shall we say, breadth and expanse. And I thought you must tell these youngsters about it. Well, I think if you, uh, it's quite funny when you go around our country and see the buildings, there's much of glass facading, uh, aluminum facading, etc., etc. coming metal up. Curtains. Metal curtains coming up. See, these are not made for a country at all. See, if it's, see, these are made in places where, you know, light is scarce. In Alpine environments, etc., a good part of Europe or wherever, where, where, you know, they've got great drab days for about eight months in a year. That's where you make these glass buildings, where you, where, where you want, to, want, want to be harvesting the light into the buildings. But what we have been doing here right now is we're actually making these into big, big ovens and using, you mean, using, uh, and spending a bomb on trying to air condition them. And then trying to spend a lot of money on bringing in glass, which is actually bringing down ULUR value, whatever, etc., 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 etc. Instead of these, if you look at these, if you, if you can be building it with regular masonry walls, and you, you, you have your windows where you want it, and bring your light where you want it. These buildings becoming much more, much more efficient. There's so much of our own technology which we have, which we can use on, within our own places, which can be. Do you believe it. that this lies in the hands of the uh, builders and contractors, or in the hands of the designers. the designers? I feel the designers and architects need to be talking about this, and I think people need to be. Uh, Why are you need to be educated? The promoters who are insisting that the architects offer them such values. Yes, I think and the promoters so. also are very important, but I feel it is the responsibility of the designers to let people know what what are the pitfalls in using this because it is i let it be a green belt it will be a green building consultant or consultants architects these people need to be telling telling the promoters very clearly what is it percentage wise let, let them start telling them boss you're going to be using maybe about so much so much more energy to, to look at this you know you mean all these issues we don't you talk to them about this and you also have to be looking at it from the area of maintenance maintenance is an issue which is a big problem in our country Nobody maintains buildings, right? be it in private space or in government space. And many of them who have put up such glass curtains and metal curtains in the last 15 years are deeply regretting this yes. today because they are paying at least twice as much as yes. air conditioning bills. Sometimes it can be two to three crores per month. Yes, you know, much, per much building. bigger. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the maintenance. Absolutely. Because these, these things deteriorate much faster. Yes. See, if you can go and look at any of our, of our older buildings, which have been, I'm talking about the medieval buildings. You look at the Air India building, for example, in uh, Bombay or whatever. Yes. Which is good part of it is, is masonry and some part of it is only a very small part of it is glass or wherever. You look at they're fine. But you look at the same glass building with 15, 20 years of, I mean, they need to be fully replaced. Yes. That's, that's, that's the situation. I hear what you're saying. Yes. We move to, I think we'll skip this about drywalls, unless you want to say something. I feel this has got a big uh, future. Drywall, I feel, has got a very big future in our country. And uh, it's an untapped source, which is uh, which people have kept off, I don't know, very strangely. But I feel that drywalls are, are here to stay. And it because reduces construction. Water. Definitely, definitely. Because I feel anything which can make things faster will will help you achieve what you have, what you have done at, the, at the COP21. If you want to be doing all those things, drywalls are going to be your answer. Because this is going to, this is actually taking up and knocking off a lot of your construction time. It's, it's a dry system. So this, I think, has got a very, very big future. Any example of anyone who has done this in India on some scale? It is. I mean, if you look at a good number of our hospitals in our country, they're all drywall systems. You, you, you look at any of the big hospitals in our country, they're all using drywall, drywall systems. Why is it confined to hospitals? See, the <clears throat> aspect is, the minute you want to be doing it in a public building, which you're going to be selling, there is a huge problem with your end, end user. Uh, he doesn't want to use it because he feels that the drywalls are flimsy. He's got, he's got an issue with it. Hospitals, what happens is, you know, it's, it's the, even the, the owner is the user there, basically. He's, he's the, uh, the end. thing is, you want it at that level, and the number of walls in a hospital are, number, are, are huge because you're creating wards, you're creating private. You say that of residential buildings too. Yes, yes. residential buildings, the same issue because the end user is a the problem there again. But the, I, I, I spoke right at the beginning. 
in the minute it's and where it where, where I'm going to be building it, I'm going to be owning it, I'm going to be renting it out, I can use it. That's right. I've got no problem in it because the guy who's going to come in there is going to stay there for a year or two and he's going to move on. Absolutely. I get it. I, but are you doing it in your own uh, project? See, I am I am I am using I am using various methods here which is which almost there because for example I'm using a lot of 3D panels. 3D panels, which you can say is almost 80% dry because, because I just do a coat on outside, but it's, I'm using a 3D panel. And now, if wherever possible, definitely I would love to be using these dry walls wherever, wherever possible, wherever it's, it's where it's a product which I'm not selling. Okay, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I get, I get your point. You're essentially talking about market consumer behavior yes. on owning homes or yes. home buyers. Yes. Yeah. That's something that you all have to think about too, you know, whether you're architects or engineers or people who are driving businesses, critical for you to understand that it's, some of these innovations are not taking off because the market is resisting it. Come plastics and carbon. Yeah, so this is thing which is again, uh, I think very, very exciting. And if you can uh, really bring down the threshold costing on these, yeah. on these, uh, on this technology, it can be a big game changer, very big game changer. See, we've been using, uh, because I come from the uh, repair and rehabilitation uh, area, yes. we've been using carbons we, for maybe for 25, 30 years now, carbon fibers for 25, 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, in India, we've been using it maybe for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, these carbon fiber retrofits, etc., etc., work very well. We have had no problem with them at all. Very efficient. Mm -hmm. They have, they have uh, given us ex excellent flexural strength and the, it, has, it has worked very well. And I feel that uh, this is something which is exciting, but the threshold costing needs to come down. But in the context of waterproofing and the risks that we have in buildings, do you see this material playing a role? Yes, yes, definitely. And definitely. we have to remember that the waterproofing industry is growing CAGR the last seven years at some 25% year upon year. Yeah. So obviously our buildings are constructed badly. And, you know, people in that business of waterproofing materials are doing better. I would not say that the buildings are being constructed badly, but I think the awareness has increased. Mm -hmm. So people have been are using a lot of waterproofing as preventive measures, mm -hmm. then as a repair measure. Please, please, I think that is something we got to understand mm -hmm. because a good part of the waterproofing industry is a preventive industry mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. It's I mean if you look at the repair part of it, it's still very small, but I think it's still that building a build, the the quality of the buildings built in our country, I would say, are world class today. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, say that there, there's any uh, this thing there. Good part of the waterproofing industry is in the preventive side, sir. I would, I would not uh, agree by saying that it's on the repair side. Yeah. But some of you will want to remember that waterproofing, clearly, let's say a 3,000 square feet building, can be as much as 5 to 6%. I'm building a 50 lakh construction cost project. I will be spending 2 to 2.5 to 3 lakhs on just waterproofing. Is that right? See, I would, I would put it this way, I spend that much of money on waterproofing and weatherproofing because I would like to isolate these two. These two need to be isolated because many people cons confuse waterproofing to weatherproofing. It is not true, but I think that the 5% number will include weatherproofing. Fair enough. Um, into, therefore, the last three questions. What is, what would you want to think is that one big scale or maybe two? That aids a person's employability. See, the problem See, I will, I will, I will, I will, let me yeah. put it in another way. To those of you listening and who have come through this far with uh, Sri Ram and I, you must know that India is putting out about 1.5 million engineers every year from about 3,500 colleges. Staggering. And the challenge also is no more than about 7 or 8 percent of you, of those who are coming out, are employable. And this is one of the reasons that this question has been put up for Sri Ram to see if he will want to offer some advice to you all. Well, sir, I think uh, I've worked with a lot of students over the years, and even you know, today I do. And I've also been part. And at uh, various levels, and also I've been part of. Uh, the interview panel for quite a few construction corporates. Well, what we, what I would, uh, what we've been looking at is that the corporates know, the construction companies know 
that these people have their problems, that there, that there are a lot of deficiencies in the, in the skill sets of these engineers. But what I would, I would just put it down to two words. It's attitude and aptitude. This is what people are really looking at. Even these construction companies, the professionals very clearly tell me, we are well aware of deficiencies, but we really want students who can really absorb. Now, offline, you are telling me that you have in Mysore alone got 2,200 engineering students, 250, as many as 250 architect students every year coming out. Yes, yes. And your interaction with the faculty as well as students, what does it tell you? See, <clears throat> this was a small correction. Now, we are working with about 2,200 students. These are spread across all the three years of, of engineering because I don't, we don't touch students in the first year because they're still, that's common to all branches. The minute they get into the respective branch, there's the third semester to the eighth semester. So there's about three batches at a time. In each college, we're working about 11 engineering colleges. So the, these make up 2,200. So we've been talking to these students and till last year, the, by and large, the engineering institutions were not listening to us because some of students were being absorbed through various streams. But from last year, this is, the situation has become really bad. Employment has become very difficult. So right now, they've at least started and sitting up and talking, I mean, listening to what we're saying. Because there's a lot of lacunae which lies within the system itself. We don't have teachers who know. So today, they are feel threatened by industry. Teachers feel threatened by industry. Because the minute we go, the industry goes and talks to students, and students go back and ask questions, Teachers don't have answers to that. So, you know, if you look at, though there are things called the quality improvement program, et cetera, et cetera, but I feel today it's, it's really bad. But today, but recently I was speaking to the uh, member secretary of the Engineering Council of India, who was uh, in my store, Dr. Farooq, and he was telling me something very good that he is now, they're now actually devising a system throughout the country where the it's not just students, the teachers also, they have talked with the professors and the faculty of engineering also will need to go through evaluation systems periodically, almost on an, on an annual basis, where they will have to be keeping abreast with technology and what's happening around the world. This, if they, the, these things come through, I think that's going to be a big game changer there. But as I'm telling you, you asked me two words, I would, I mean, what, what, what would put it? Attitude and aptitude. If this is right, we can, we can churn out very good engineers because I think the basics are wonderful. The basics of basics, which are, which are put into our engineer, of our students there are wonderful. It's just that I feel the last mile is missing. You know, it's interesting also uh, for you to be saying that, you know, nearly four semesters of math is taught. Yes. Which is wonderful. also across the, country, across the world. It's not so much, India. it's not so, but here it is, it is. It, that gives a solid foundation, that gives a solid foundation. To the students but they are not applying their mind it's not happening again <laughs> again i come back to the same issue yeah okay um interesting for for you know that you see two two sides to this uh, to this uh, challenge of teachers feeling threatened on one side and students not bringing enough confidence well think about it all of you out there as you listen to what mr sriram has to say on the last two questions for this hour how important is, the construct, uh, for, is it for you all to adapt to changing demands of the client in the context of emerging technologies? What do, you, what do you need to be doing in terms of quality expectations from you as an employee on product alternatives and such strategies that you need to be bringing? It's a, it's a, it's a white canvas question. Let's see what Sriram has to offer us. <clears throat> I always tell my students or even working professionals whom I, we, we do a lot of uh, training programs for, and one simple question I ask them is that uh, they spend a lot of time with the telephone every day. Today, telephone has become an intrinsic part of life. It's all of them have got smartphones in their pockets. And today, with the data revolution in our country, thanks to whatever has happened in the last year, data has become very cheap. And people are using huge bandwidths of data every day on their pocket phones. I always ask this question, how much time are you using to further your knowledge? In your, in your industry, which you are part of, in your vocation. Absolutely. And surprisingly, sir, I get these answers that not even 5% of them are using, 5%, not even 5% of data has been used towards this. Mm -hmm. 
they're using splurging data on issues which are as either whether it be on social media or whatever, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but not using even a part of this. I, I tell, I beg my students, I beg my working professionals, kindly give me 15 to 20 percent of that data. Kindly start using it for because you've got an information superhighway in your pocket. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please tap that. You please tap that information superhighway there. It can the things can change. I said, you, you owe it to yourself. I tell my, I tell my students, I tell these guys, yeah. you owe it to yourself. Yeah. Forget about anybody else. You owe it to yourself. Yes. You please do this and lo and behold, see what's going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go on, last one. There we are. Precast, prefab, refitted modular structures. I know you've been working in Istanbul. You've been not a student, but also, you know, a professing the uh, experience uh, kind of person who's been, you know, uh, an advocate for industry. If I remember right, See, was it three years ago that one of these prominent builders in Bangalore ushered in a technology, thanks to you, to see how he can speed up his uh, process of execution itself. True, true, true. I think the this is my my favorite question you can ask me. But uh, today we are we've actually gone to a level where we are saying that let us not build anymore. There is manufacture. There is manufacture. I have been uh, talking about bringing in the best practices of, say, an, an automotive industry into construction. See, because now if you look at everybody is talking about a lean, a lean manufacturing system. Right. I think we need to be talking about a lean construction system, right. when where we need to be really bringing in what bringing in assuring changes, where we need to be totally mechanizing ourselves, and we we start. So we have to start manufacturing buildings. I think we, we need to get out of building anymore. I think that is the future we have, where we need to be, as you, as you said, this either prefab or prefitting or whatever. This is the future. And I think technology is playing a very, very big part here because I think it's coming in. And one thing which I saw in especially my one of my big learnings from the seminar and working on the seminar for the last one year in trying to, you know, see what's happening in the world. I've been, I've been to various parts of the world just to see what's happening on this. Something which was very heartening to see was a good number of the professionals working on this technology in foreign universities are Indian students. Are Indian students. They're, they're, and I will not say students, the Indian professors, Indian assistant professors who are working in, in, and it's just not in the US. We've always seen a lot of our Indian students in the US and Australia but I've been seeing a lot of these Indian students in Europe too. And they are Aston professors, et cetera, et cetera, working on robotics, working, working in 3D printing and construction. You must tell us about this 17 year old uh, Wizkid. Yeah, and this what is he's doing a 19 this year old Wizkid who's an American uh, kid who's just 19 years old. Uh, and, and he was with you on air this last Sunday. Yeah, this is just uh, last Saturday. He was on a live web chat with me in front of 500 people. And this, this youngster, 17 year old school dropout, opened a company called Aptitude and sold it, made multi million dollars. Where was this? This was in the US, in San Francisco. And uh, San Francisco is the second Bangalore. I mean, I'm, I'm, Bangalore is second San Francisco. Today we say San Francisco yeah. is second Bangalore because Bangalore has come to that level today. But it was a startup there. And now he's made a, made a company called Casa. You said he has turned his first million dollar and yes, moved yes. on to his next company. Yes, next company. Very exciting company where he's going to be manufacturing three different models of the world's first robotic 3D printer. And he says he's going to build the world's first 3D printer skyscraper in Dubai. And the government of Dubai has taken him very seriously and has given him a lot of funding, given him space, so much so that he's moved to Dubai. And I mean, this is the future. When we're looking at real youngsters coming up with new ideas. So you're saying in. that you, 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 we are soon to see maybe a hundred uh, meters, maybe 200 meters building with 3D robotics driving the design. It, it's, it's, and not, it's, it's not very it's far away. It's not very far away, sir. It's not very far away at all. I mean, I, the way technology has been coming into industry has been something amazing right now. And I think if you look at the demographic profile of our country, I think we stand, we are going to be standing very tall when it comes to technology and construction. Well, I'll accept that has his famous last words that India will stand tall the next 15 years. We you know one, one thing that we have a very daunting period ahead of us, or we can say that it's, it's going to be really exciting. 
and offering each one of our engineers and architects and designers a very, very exciting potential future. The, you know, the, the interesting words that I found coming from him over this last 45 minutes plus is, uh, 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 stick in my mind in some ways. Concrete is a gigantic scavenger and can take a lot of waste that is put out in this country in a way that we upscale and reuse. He's talking about information superhighway in your pocket. What are you going to do about using that in a way that you reskill yourself beyond what your teachers can do in universities and colleges? Drone-based surveys and what it can mean as potential employment for you all. A hundred thousand engineers versus very, very wild stab and guess, but maybe the number lies at 2x or 3x of that estimate. I'm not going to ask Mr. Sriram for what wants to offer on that one, but think about that one. And critically, very, very importantly, I think what he's saying is that into the future, we are not going to be building buildings, we're going to be manufacturing buildings. With that, I think I would want to sign off we will, with your, your chat session and responses for that begins now. Thank you for so many of those that have come in. Very interesting, very heartening to see you all engaging with the sort of insights and stuff that uh, Sri Ram has offered you today. And into this next 15 minutes, he will see how he can take as many of these questions and offer you solutions, responses, directions. Thank you once again. Thank you. Yeah, now what happens is that day, so